So, today, we're going to be talking about Psalm 90. So, Monday, what did we talk about? Anyone remember Monday? Yeah. What about Psalm 2? Yeah, we were rebellious against God and He rules over everything and how we can trust and abide in Him. Yeah, you can go get something if you want. What about Tuesday? Yeah. What about Psalm 19? <laughs> Cheating! <clears throat> go for it, right here. Uh, we talked about Psalm 19, um, talking about abiding in God's word, right? Abiding in God's word and how it's trustworthy and true. Yeah. We talked about how he testified for the trust in God and how he was able Yeah, that was yesterday, right? That was Psalm 46. You could go get something. And then what did we talk about? We jumped ahead. What did we talk about on Wednesday? Saw your hand the whole time. Mm, yeah, Psalm 23, abiding in the shepherd. You go for it. So today we're going to be talking about Psalm 90. And I'm going to be honest, we're going to be like busting through Psalm 90. Like I want to get through all of it for you guys. And so Psalm 90. Does anyone, does anyone know Psalm 90? Does anyone know Psalm 90 at all? All right. So quickly, sword drill. Sword, drill, hands up, all the way up, all the way up, all the way up, full extension. And I'll give you a quick synopsis of what Psalm 90 is. Psalm 90 is a psalm of Moses. It's the only psalm that Moses wrote. It is the oldest psalm that kind of really starts the book of Psalms. All right? So written by Moses, Psalm chapter 90. Go. There's no way. You put your thumb there? <laughs> All right, you guys can go get something. Go. Why don't you read it for us? <clears throat> Psalm 90, here we go. Lord, you have been a refuge in every generation before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and, and the world. From eternity to eternity, you are God. Hurry up. All right, all right, all right. Thank you, thank you. Establish the work of our hands. Great job. You, the rest is yours. There's like a big handful in there. Great job. What's your name? What was her uh, name? Oh, sorry. Rachel. 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 Yes, we met online. Rachel, yeah. Give Rachel a hand. <clears throat> um, so, Psalm 90, and we're going to, I mean, we're going to go like Mach 10 right through this. And 
Psalm of Moses. Guys, if you want to know, like kind of encapsulating what we've been talking about all week, all week, and I think Psalm 90 just really does a good job with it. Abide in Christ, our hope in life and death. Abide in Christ, our hope both in life and in death. This is a true reality for you if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so this psalm, I think, is so important for us to understand the hope that we have as believers. So when we look at Psalm 90, we see it's a psalm of Moses. It's the oldest psalm, and it begins the book of the collection of psalms. This is the only psalm that Moses ever penned, like I said, and it was written with him facing the situation of being in the wilderness. They've left Egypt and survived, and it's during this time frame that Moses wrote it. Moses splits up this pretty well for us, and he gives the basis of God's immortality. He shares with us our mortality, And then lastly, he has some requests for God. And so right in the beginning, look at verse 1. You have been our dwelling place in all generations. He begins here by addressing the immortality of God, proclaiming the immortality of God. It is a powerful beginning to this psalm. This, real, this, this reality, this really big God of the universe now seen here as described by Moses as the dwelling place of Israel. Do you guys get that? Their home is God. Their dwelling place is God. Their safety is God. Their reality is God. Think about it. They have been wandering in the desert. And Moses says... In all of our generations, you have been our dwelling place. We're wandering. Harsh climates, but yet you provide for us. We dwell in you. You, God, have been our dwelling place. They had no dwelling. They were basically gypsies. They had no home, but here Moses declares on behalf of the people of Israel, God is our dwelling place. Now, Christian, friends, if you know Jesus, He is your dwelling place today. He has brought you into the family of God so intimately that you can declare with Moses this reality this morning. If you know Jesus, you can say, you have been my dwelling place in all generations. We know this to be true from Colossians even, when Paul writes, if, you have, if then you have been raised with Jesus Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things below here on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and in God. That is your reality. This is your identity now. Nothing that the world tells you even remotely comes close to what you are and who you are. If you know Jesus, you're a child of God. This is your primary function and identity now. You dwell in Him and He in you. And so verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, he says, Moses proceeds on describing the power and might and authority of God. When I read this, I had to look this up. Does anyone know? How old Mount Everest is? Does anyone know? Huh? Quite old. 60 million years old. 60 million. Then we hear from Moses this reality. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you have ever formed the earth, and from from the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you were God. You are God from everlasting before the mountains. The weight of this statement here. Here's what Moses is doing for us and the original intended audience. He is setting up the majesty, power, and authority of God over all things. God is in control over everything. 
He is sovereign so that we can come to the summit of fear and death. And we can say with Moses, he was here from everlasting to everlasting. Nothing even comes in close to compare to the majesty and power of God. This is foundational for us to understand our place in creation, who we are. Often we consider God and the power of God. And then we kind of like try to understand him and extrapolate things from there. We try to understand God in terms of ourself. And then we look into his character. This is a false understanding of God. If you are confused about who you are and who you belong to, look toward God. And this will bring you clarity, not only about who God is, but who you are. Who you are in light of an almighty creator. And so Moses moves from God's immortality and majesty to our mortality. Verse 3, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. This is, why we, this is what we say at funerals, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Moses is reminding us of the words back in Genesis. By the seed of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. This is where we push back, though. Our mortality is scary. Death is scary. The fear of death is scary. And so he says this as a reminder in verses 4 to 6. A thousand years in your sight are but yesterday as, as it is past. Or as a watch in the night, you sweep away with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. And in the morning it flourishes and renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. Moses is giving us some images here. First, let's unpack them all quickly. What is he saying? Well, he's saying even if you... Have, even if you lived a thousand years, it's like a day in relationship to God. It's nothing in terms of God's eternity or being with Him for eternity. Even more, it's like a single night to God. Or our days are so easily swayed, it's like a flood that comes in and sweeps everything away, like, the, like there's a giant flood. You guys know about Yellowstone right now? Yellowstone, I mean, it's being wrecked. Like giant floods through Yellowstone Park. It's horrible. But that's what it's like. It's like a flood that sweeps us away. Or, or it's like a blade of grass, a single blade of grass where in the morning it is renewed, but at night it withers. <clears throat> They're like a passing dream. There's a plea here for Moses under these kind of images he gives us. And I'm skipping ahead here, but it, it is the point of this psalm. Be wise with your days. Abide in Christ, our hope in life and in death, because each day is not promised to you. All of us are young. We like to think we're invincible. We'll be here for a while. We are not. This is like a person who has stacked up like trillions of dollars. Right? I'm talking about like a lot of money, like tons of money, tons and tons of money. And like an exponential amount of money. A hundred bucks is nothing to them. Like literally nothing. So if you and I live to be a thousand or even a couple or even just more than a thousand. It's not even a couple hours in the time frame of God. Even if you be, if, like Moses says, even if you live to 70 and in your own strength you get to 80, it's like five minutes. Why does Moses do this in the Psalm? You may be saying, this is super sad. Like, Jared, I did not come to chapel this morning to be sad by death. I agree, it's a, it's a valid statement. Right? When, I, when I read this, I was like, Moses is trying to give all the readers a hard time, probably. I right? just, he's not doing that. He's reminding us that our hope is in God. This is the reality throughout the Bible. We see this in James. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For it is a mist and 
that appears for a little while and then vanishes. But again, we push back on this idea. We say things like, age is just a number. 70 is the new 50, right? I, won't, I think the statements can be true, but I also think as I look at my tiny son, he's gonna be two in October. The days are catching up with me and I'm only 30. So when I look back at my life on a park bench 40 years from now, walking my dog who's flying in the air in some kind of saucer, where did the time go? What can we learn from this view of these verses? I think, namely, that death hasn't gripped you. But believer, Christian, friend, if you're here and you are a believer in Jesus, it has not taken you yet. Death is, is not your reality yet. So what do we do with it? Let it shake you. Let it remind you of your purpose and let it heal you. And even let it terrify you to remind you of the assurance that you have in Jesus. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, let it terrify you. Come, come to grip with it. Wrestle with it. And then proclaim Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Repent and believe. He is our hope, both in life and in death. Abide in Christ. Now, why do we have to die? This is the question. Why? A lot of people ask this question. Atheists ask this question. Why do we have to die? Well, verses 7 to 10. The answer is in 7. Death is the punishment for man's rebellion. This is straight from Genesis. This is what happens in the garden. This is the truth from all of Scripture, that sin is bringing death. God is not indifferent to man's rebellion. We've talked about this this week. And we as believers should not want this. We should want a God who is serious on sin and our rebellion. If we don't, it would be like having a dentist do our open heart surgery. It doesn't make sense. You want a God who knows what sin is and what, it is, what it's about. You see, friends, God has dealt with this so intimately and so deeply that we have a truth that we can hold to, that Christ is our dwelling place, that we now abide in him for both life and death. When the flood came, God provided man's safety. When Adam and Eve sinned, he provided them clothing to deal with their nakedness. When death was so imminent, God provided his only son to live perfectly and to die wrongfully and to raise again gloriously. If that does not excite you this morning, I do not know what will. We have a savior who reigns, who's, who's real. Someone actually died for you and I. Really. Not hyperbole, not imagery. This is not like something out of the ether that's like, we should be indifferent about, we should be, we, we should be in awe. This is reality, even by the words of Paul in Romans. This is the reality of all Scripture. There's a choice here for all of us. We can either recognize this verse and confront it with the Lord, or we can cover it up. I would propose to all of you, that often we cover it up. If we're honest with ourselves, or if I'm honest with myself, I don't want to live on in the heart of my son. I want to live forever. I don't want to deal with death. I want to live on in, the, in a house with my wife. But that's the old flesh talking. Some of you guys, you guys want to get married before you die. 
But here in verse, seven, uh, verse 11, he goes on, Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? In other words, who, here Moses is saying, Who puts these two things together? Who puts anger and his wrath according to the fear of him together? The answer is staring at us, friends. Uh, consider God's anger on sin. We've talked about this. He's not indifferent. But he steps in to save us. Uh, I, wanna, I want you guys to understand something. Satan does not run hell. Hell was made for Satan. And hell was made for every, everybody who rebels against God. It is, it is the living Christ who subjects people to punishment in hell. We need to be saved from the Lamb's wrath. We need to be saved from Jesus' wrath. Not Satan's. He's not all-powerful. He provides a way. We, if you, if you know Jesus this morning, don't have to deal with the power of his anger or his wrath according to the fear of God. And so Moses has some requests. So teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. This is a strange request. It is estimated that during this wandering that 15,000 people died annually. This is the request of Moses, that our days are not merely promised to us, but Lord, help us, teach us to be wise with them. Friends, be wise with the days you have. You guys are here. Study and learn under these awesome teachers. Be wise with the time that you have this week, this last day at camp, to hone your skills and to use them for the glory and majesty of God's kingdom. That is wise. Trust in the Lord, abide in Christ for hope both in life and in death. That is wise. Verse 13, return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. I can just imagine Moses sitting there penning this psalm as, he, as his prayer is saying, Lord, you have saved us from Egypt. You have saved us from the oppressor. We are here now. And look at the mess. Is this not our prayer? This very moment, whatever your circumstances, I mean, the last three years, I did not know 2020 was going to be a trilogy. Really, I didn't know it was going to be this crazy. But this is, isn't this our prayer? God, look at the mess. Look at the war. Look at the divisiveness and discrimination. Look at, look at the, the sickness and perilous everything. Please do something. I'm begging you. I'm unsatisfied, God. Please do something. And he says this next part, friends, hear this. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. That we may rejoice and be glad all our days. This is an amazing verse in what seems to be a very morbid setting and a, and a setting in a psalm that is so pertinent to you now but this is in fact the very setting that makes it so beautiful the morbidity of it why is this the gospel well we are brought to an end by your anger by your wrath we're dismayed our sins are known to you and yet in all of this god shows his steadfast love by supplying it to us saying i will satisfy you and he does and he is glad to do it. Brother and sister, what is this steadfast love? What is this covenant love? What, what right does Moses have to write this? What is, what is it that meets our deepest, darkest fears and our deepest, darkest sins and questions? The anger and the wrath of God. What meets it all? It is Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God. Know Him. Abide in Him for both life and death. This is the echo of 1 John chapter 4. In this love, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a propitiation for our sins. Our, our death has been handled by another. Our life is found in the life of another. That is Jesus Christ. Friends, God has made a way he has sent His Son to enter into our mess, into our sin, into our rebellion and hatred so that those who come to know Jesus would have provision of life and have it abundantly and eternally. Friends, 
Abide in Christ, who is your hope and my hope, both in life and in death. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you that Psalm 90 kind of like encapsulates everything, how we can trust you and abide in you, how we can trust in your word and in your promises, how we can trust you as the good shepherd, how we can trust you as our mighty fortress and in all of life's circumstances, that we can trust you both in life and in death. Help us abide in you and abide in your word. Help us have a love for the holy and righteous things. Help us love your word. As David says in 19, like the sweet drippings of the honeycomb. Thank you for all of these things. We pray that you would fix our minds and our eyes and our hearts on you and supply the strength for these guys to Uh, just with their concert this evening and, and all their studying for the rest of the day. In your name, amen. Thank you.